Remember last week, we, we started chapter 12, so we're going to be in the middle. We're going to be starting in verse 12. But um, from last week, it was kind of the, the aftermath of Lazarus being raised from the dead, right? Um, there was a party at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. Jesus was there. And um, from that event, we saw this divide. There was a divide between believers and unbelievers that we saw last week. And we kind of charted the course for each one. And we saw the different direction that each path leads to. And we saw how unbelief, it, it stems from this envy and a promotion of selfish interest. The Pharisees were um, mad that Jesus was getting all this attention, and so they were jealous of him. And so that was what they, that was what their intentions drew from, their jealousy of Jesus. And so they were they decided that they needed to get rid of him. And it's kind of been that way. There's been this tension between Jesus and the Jewish leaders, and they have to get rid of him because of their jealousy. And we saw that that envy, that jealousy, and the promotion of selfish interest, we, it, it led to a lack of fellowship with Jesus. Because there was a verse last week that pointed out that Jesus no longer walked among the Jews. So their hard hearts kind of, Jesus had, you know, we've seen it time and again. He has, he's had many interactions with the Jewish leaders, but as their hearts grow harder and harder, Jesus becomes more and more distant from them until finally he withdrew completely. But the believer's path was a much better one. And we got to take a look at that also. And we saw how belief leads to life in Jesus. Lazarus was a living example of Jesus' power, right? He was dead in the grave four days. He stinketh. Remember that? He was dead, all dead. And Jesus' power was manifest within Lazarus' life. He was a living testament of Jesus and his power. And we also saw that belief leads to fellowship with Jesus because after Lazarus was raised from the dead, we saw last week they were at, you know, Mary Martha, Lazarus' house, and there was fellowship that was had between them and Jesus. And so as a believer, we get to have fellowship with Jesus versus losing that fellowship as an unbeliever. And then as believers, we also get to participate in the privilege that we call worship. And we saw that through what Mary brought to Jesus, her offering of a full year's wage of perfume to Jesus. And so as believers, we get to offer back to Jesus what he has given us. He has given us life. And so for us to give that back to him is our worship to him. It's our living sacrifice, if you will, like our memory verse talks about. And where unbelievers receive rebuke, remember Judas came forward and he was mad about Mary's offering because he was worried about the poor. And John was like, really, he was a robber. And so the unbelievers get, get rebuke from Jesus, whereas the believer receives affirmation. And so today, um, we're going to be jumping into a, a different, it's a new event. It, and it happens five days before Passover. 12.1 says, six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. That's what we saw last week. And so then today, in verse 12, it ushers us in, John ushers us in with the next day. So we're now five days before Passover. And as we've been studying the past couple of weeks, we've been in John 11. We saw all that, all that happened with Lazarus, and here we are after, afterwards, after that event. And today we're going to see the shift. The shift, we saw the shift from Jesus' public ministry in chapter 11 to his private one. It, it began his private ministry. And today, we see another shift. And this shift is in the timeline of the Father. And it's going to be in, in verse 23. We'll get there in a minute. But we're going to see this shift in, in the timeline. 
We've seen, we've seen this shift from Jesus' ministry from public to private, and now we're going to see this other shift in the Father's timeline. But before we get there, I want to point out that there are five days before the Passover, and this week I was um, studying. I wrestled real hard with this one, trying to wrap my mind around what was going on during this week. And so I kind of mapped it out, and I'll give you um, kind of my thoughts on that, because... John doesn't record everything that happened over this week. He only brings out the important stuff, the stuff that was important to John, the stuff that, you know, was consistent with his theme of pointing to Jesus' deity and his clash of the spiritual versus physical worldview of, you know, the people that Jesus dealt with in Jesus. And so I point this out because there are a few things happen be that happened between Jesus' triumphal entry that we're going to see, and then this next event of when he talks about the parable of the grain dying so that it can multiply. And what happened was, so the triumphal entry happens, and then Jesus goes to the temple and he clears the temple. That happens before this other conversation. And Jesus didn't stay in Jerusalem. Over this week, he would go into Jerusalem to teach at the temple, and then he would head back to his uh, headquarters, I guess, in Bethany with Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And so we would just go back and forth. And over one of their travels, the, the fig tree, Jesus was hungry. He wanted a fig. There was no fig there. He curses the fig tree. The disciples are bewildered because the next day it's just dead beyond recognition. And so that event happens. John doesn't talk about that, but I want you to know about it because we're going to be kind of over a couple days in our study today. John didn't feel the need to include all of that, like I said. And so his main focus was Christ's deity. Now before we get into our study, I'm, I'm going to set the stage a little bit. Jerusalem is very busy at this time. Everyone's coming in for the Passover, getting ready to celebrate. But there's a different atmosphere around Jerusalem. Because everyone's talking about Jesus. It was a popular subject of that day to talk about Jesus. And rumor of his latest and greatest miracle in raising Lazarus from the dead is circulating around the town. So everyone is looking for Jesus. Jesus isn't there. He's in Bethany. And as he comes in, we get to see this event that happens. And every, but everyone's interpretation of the works of Jesus and their expectation of him is wrong. We're going to be taking a look at that. And Jesus is going to set the record straight as we get towards the latter part of our study today. Everyone has this incorrect assumption that Jesus is there for his glory, to be, to be king, to conquer Rome to set up the Jewish nation as, you know, his people and his kingdom. But that's not, that's not why Jesus came, and we're going to take a look at that. So with that, if you'll join me, 12, verse 12, it says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And they cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore the people who were with him when he had called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him, because they heard that he had done this sign. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. And then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. 
Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, dignifying by what death he would die. And the people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. And these things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. As we begin, John paints for us this grand spectacle. This grand spectacle of this great multitude coming to meet Jesus as he enters Jerusalem. Everyone with high expectations of what Jesus is going to do next. But everyone there, in the midst of all the excitement, misses the real reason that Jesus is coming. And you see, in the eyes of the people, Jesus is their liberator. He's their freedom. And in him they see this freedom, but they miss the truth of Jesus' purpose. He's tried to tell them over and again that he's come on behalf of the Father, not on behalf of himself. And you see, the people's view is merely physical and only applies to what they were experiencing right then in that moment. They wanted to be liberated from Rome, and Jesus was their avenue. Jesus to them was a politician. He was their leader or a king in their eyes, or he had that potential, I should say. And we see it in their words in verse 13. They took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now there are four groups mentioned from verses 12 to 19. There's the multitude, the disciples, the witnesses who were at Lazarus' grave site when he came forth from the dead, and then we also see the Pharisees. And as we look at each group, Each group puts this wrong, incorrect label on Jesus. And out of all of these groups, not one of them knew the correct reason for the things Jesus did. And so I think that that leads to Jesus then having to set the record straight towards the end of our study. And if we dig a little deeper and take a a deeper look into what the crowd was shouting, we can see the expectation of their hearts. The shout of Hosanna meant save now. And it comes out of Psalm 118. If you want to turn there, it's Psalm 118, verses 25 through 26. It says, Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The people are looking like I said, for Jesus to be their liberator. They want freedom. They want it now. He's their political savior. 
And Jesus is going to make clear his true intentions later on. But the people don't understand. And all the people really had to do, Jesus doesn't have to tell them. All they had to do is pay attention to the imagery within Jesus' coming. To come to enter into a city in that day, riding on a donkey was a symbol of peace. Jesus is bringing peace to Israel. Peace to humanity in his death for us. That equals salvation. And Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey fulfills the prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. I'll read it to you. It says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That prophecy was a few hundred years before Jesus came. Jesus fulfills it. The only person in Jerusalem on this day that understood what was really going on was Jesus. It's fitting, right? He always knew what was going on. But the people are all, they all miss the point of Jesus being there. And we see that Jesus' heart for the people is evident. If you, if you want to read the other account from Luke, all four Gospels have this account of Jesus' triumphal entry. But the account from Luke 19 tells us Jesus wept over the city as he drew near to it. He was troubled for the city and their misunderstanding of who he was. And no one knew the true intention of Jesus. John even tells us the disciples didn't even know. We read, Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, As it is written, we read the prophecy in Zechariah, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And then in verse 16, John explains to us, His disciples did not understand these things at first. So the disciples are probably walking along, either beside or behind Jesus. There was a lot of people who were looking to kill Jesus, so the disciples were probably on edge wherever they went, kind of acting as his bodyguards, his bouncers. And we we get a look at that. We see Philip and Andrew's interaction with these Greek guys later. But John tells us they didn't even understand it until Jesus had gone away to heaven. He says, But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. And then after that, we see this group of people who is at the tomb of Lazarus. Remember, there was these Jewish, this group of Jews who were mourning alongside Mary. And as Mary went to the tomb, everyone followed her there. And from that group, there was this divide of, excuse me, believers from that remnant and then non-believers. And so I I think that probably, and this is just my speculation, I'm just going off speculation. The group of Jews who believed in Jesus, they probably would have continued to follow him afterwards, and then everyone who was in the unbelieving group, we saw them go and tell the Pharisees about what happened, but then they would go to Jerusalem. How could you keep an event like that to yourself? It would be pretty difficult. Hey, last week or the other day, I was at this dead guy Lazarus' funeral, and he came out of the grave. Jesus did it. Like, That's a rumor that gets spread like wildfire. And so we see that because of that rumor, all these people are gathered to see Jesus. There's this group that wants Jesus to be their king, and then there's this other group who's there just to see what Jesus is going to do next. Coming to see the circus of Jesus, his next event. What crazy thing is this guy going to do next? It says, therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. And for this reason the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The 
These are the just the curious folk looking for a show, the curious onlookers. And then lastly, we look at we see the Pharisees in verse 19, and the Pharisees stay consistent with their character. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing? Look, the world has gone after after him. It's kind of funny because they're only talking to each other. It's like a circling circular firing squad in a way. They're like, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. And they're all mad about Jesus and his popularity. The popularity of Jesus is offensive to these Jewish leaders. They were jealous of all of his attention that he was getting. And that, like, that was a popular feeling for them, was their jealousy over Jesus. To them, Jesus was in it for the fame and earthly glory. Jesus was soaking all of this event in, like, oh yes, I'm so great. Thank you so much. But we know that's not true, right? Jesus has explained time and again that he's in it for the glory of the Father. And he's humbly walking this journey. All these people that we've seen so far have a merely physical view of Jesus. And so their view of Jesus comes, it stems from this physical view, this physical misunderstanding of his purpose on earth. But there's the other side to Jesus that of his deity and his spiritual intentions, his spiritual reasoning behind his purpose. Jesus is coming not for his own purposes, not for his own fame and glory, but for salvation, for us. He's coming for those people. And now as we get into the next section, I want to remind you that these events... Like I said, they happened over a few days, and so this is probably, um, if the triumphal entry is five days, I'm guessing that this is either day four or day three before the Passover, that these Greeks come to seek Jesus. And as we move into verse 20, I want you to keep your eyes open because Jesus is going to use this triumphal entry, the events of it, and then he's going to correct the narrative. He's going to put the right spin on it. Verse 20 says this, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who is from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came to Andrew and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And Jesus is going to use this request of audience with him to set the record straight on the events that happened at his triumphal entry. Something cool that Warren Wearsby pointed out was that these Gentiles, these Greeks, came seeking an audience with Jesus. And he contrasted it to the Jews who had come to Jesus seeking a sign, which I thought was pretty cool. These Greeks, they've heard all about Jesus, and they want direct contact with him. They want to talk with him. They don't want to see some crazy sign. They don't want fire called down from heaven like the Jews. Bless you. They wanted to seek Jesus. They were seeking the person of Jesus. They were seeking the source. And what's interesting is we don't know if they actually ever got this audience. It doesn't say. It just says that, you know, they came to Philip. Philip goes to Andrew. And Andrew and Philip go and tell Jesus. And then it's kind of a cliffhanger from there. But Jesus uses this request of the Gentiles because it brings to mind, hey, this is the reason for my sacrifice. We've looked at this. We saw in the parable of the Good Shepherd, Jesus was talking about his purpose to bring in another sheepfold into his fold and create one flock. So bringing in the Jewish remnant, bringing in to it the Gentile remnant, which would be us, and to make one flock. That was Jesus' purpose. 
And he uses their presence to point out the true plan and purpose that the Father has set before him. He says, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. There are two things we see in Jesus' words here. A shift of timeline and his true purpose. As for the timeline goes, Jesus says, the hour has come. Which is different, if you'll recall or remember back to passages where we've seen Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees and they get mad at him and they're going to arrest him or they decide they're going to stone him. And what does it say? What has it been saying after that event happens? Jesus escapes because why? The hour hasn't come yet, right? It points out the hour has not yet come. But verse 23 signals the shift of timeline. And Jesus says the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And the next time that we see the Jews come to arrest Jesus, they'll be allowed to do so. So there's a shift in timeline. And then as we move into verse 24, Warren Wiersbe points out, he says, the central theme of this passage is the glory of God. We, could, we would have expected Jesus to say, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be crucified. That would make sense, right? But Jesus saw beyond the cross to the glory that would follow. He wasn't, I don't think that he was excited about his death about all the pain, all the suffering that he was going to have to endure, about the separation from the Father that was going to come about because of the sin of the world being placed upon him. But he was looking forward to the glory to come after that, of being with the Father in his presence and his resurrection. And Jesus is looking to the future glory of accomplishing the work the Father has set before him and not the present glory of men. If he was, he would have taken that parade straight up to the temple, stood on the top of the stairs and said, yep, I'm king. Everyone would have cheered. Everyone would have been happy. But that wasn't why Jesus came, right? He had a spiritual aspect to his coming also. And Jesus' death not only brings glory to the Father, but it brings, also brings salvation. It brings salvation to us, to the world. And we see in his mini parable a physical picture of the spiritual multiplication his sacrifice is going to bring. He tells us, most, as, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. That's a crazy picture, isn't it? A grain of wheat by itself is by itself. A grain of wheat dead in the ground produces fruit, produces a harvest. And that's what Jesus is pointing to in himself, that his death, his being put into the ground, is going to produce the harvest of souls. And he points out he isn't in it for himself, right? He's in it for us. He's in it for the world, his sacrifice for the world. But then he goes on to explain how we as believers, we get to follow in his footsteps of laying down our life. Like Romans 12, and I'll get there in a minute. But he says this, He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now, what Jesus is not saying is that we are to mope around with this attitude of, oh, I hate my life. It's not what Jesus is saying. But rather... In his words of, he who hates his life is to mean to disregard our life as our own. To give it up to God. Realizing 
that our life is precious to us, yes, but it's precious to us only because we get to present it back to Jesus as our act of worship, as our act of sacrifice. Our life has meaning when we give it back to Jesus, when we offer it to him. And this is the idea that Paul was drawing from when he writes in his letter to the Romans that we are to be a living sacrifice, right? Sacrifice meant before Jesus' death, it meant to die, literally. The blood of lambs and goats was shed as a sacrifice. There was a lot of death that was associated with with sacrifice. But after Jesus, after the last, the greatest sacrifice of himself, to sacrifice for us means to lay down our life as a living sacrifice. So it's no longer a sacrifice that brings death, but a sacrifice that brings life to live in Christ, to be willing to live for him. And if we are to follow Jesus' example of sacrifice in our own lives, we must also have the spiritual mindset he had, which was what? The glory of the Father. Jesus, in his humility, his life on earth was for the glory of the Father, to carry out the Father's plan and purpose. And for us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, we need to have that same mindset of the Father's glory, that he would be glorified through our lives. We must be about his work and not our own. Jesus is our example of this. And um, the writer of Hebrews, he summarizes it very well. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus Jesus is our example he's the author and finisher of our finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God Jesus was looking forward with joy to what his sacrifice was, would bring and as Jesus dwells on the thought of his sacrifice, he opens up and we see, um, we see Jesus become vulnerable with his words. It was heavy on Jesus' heart. He says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? So the thought of what was, to, what was ahead of him troubled his soul. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Glorify your name. Jesus, Jesus is like, man, can I be saved from this? But he knows that his purpose is greater than just himself. Can we blame him for being troubled? Think of, I want you to think of the biggest ob obligation you've ever committed to the biggest obligation you've ever committed to, or on the eve of maybe the biggest test or exam you've ever taken. There's a lot of anxiety that can build up within you, right? As you're looking forward to this big event. Well, Jesus, those things pale in comparison to what Jesus had, the task that Jesus had before him. And so he is troubled. So you can imagine the weight that was upon him and upon his soul. But was this going to stop him? Absolutely not. He says, but for this purpose I have came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He's not in it only for himself. Like I said, he's doing it for you, for me, and for the glory of the Father is what verse 28 says. He's willing to follow through because his sacrifice is the reason he came. He's able to have this mindset because he's about the Father's glory. He's about the Father's business and not his own. And after Jesus says these things, 
something crazy happens and the Father himself speaks. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again, speaking of his name. And all the people around Jesus that hear it are perplexed. They're blown away. As the Father tells of the glory of his name and that he will continue to glorify it. They say, therefore, it says, therefore, the people who stood by and heard it and that it had thundered, said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. They're perplexed. And Jesus' first response that we see as he's headed to the cross, or his first purpose, pardon me, is the glory of the Father. Before we get into Jesus' second purpose for going to the cross, we see an interesting thought from him in verse 30. He says, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. What does Jesus mean by this? I'm going to break it down this way, and then I'm going to put it in the simplest terms that I could think of at the end. So it says, Jesus, I said, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is on behalf of the world, on our behalf, okay? He's not only doing it for the glory of the Father, but he's doing it for us. And now the Father spoke from heaven to encourage Jesus to continue on in the task set before him. So, then the question becomes, how is it then that it was for our sake that Jesus came? The Father is encouraging Jesus. Jesus says it's for our sake that, he came, that the voice came. The people didn't even understand what was said. Right? Jesus, Jesus understood, but it says, The people who stood and heard it said it had thundered. So it sounded like a rumble. And others said an angel had spoken to him. This voice came as an assurance to Jesus. Jesus is set to die on behalf of these people, on behalf of us. And so this voice is on our behalf for our good because our good comes through Jesus' sacrifice. Does that make sense? And here's the simplest way I could put it. What's good for Jesus is good for us, right? Amen. So, this voice came on behalf of Jesus for, for his sake, but through Jesus, it was for our sake. And now we get into the second part of Jesus' purpose that we see in verse 31. Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So the purpose, Jesus' second purpose is twofold. It's for the judgment of this world and for the judgment of Satan, the devil. Jesus' death equals judgment. The system of sin and death that Satan instituted upon the earth is defeated and the cross of Christ. Remember we saw Jesus put kind of death on notice that, hey, my victory is coming. My victory is imminent on the cross. You will have no more power. And in his sacrifice, he paid the price for sin, and in him salvation is available to the world. Paul summarizes it this way. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 says, For since by man came death, and by man also came the resurrection of the dead, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And in, so in the New King James, it's man and man in verse 21. The first man is um, not capital, capitalized. And then the second man is capitalized, sig signifying Jesus. It's this difference between Adam and Jesus. And in Jesus' death, Christ simplifies the system. See, for every person that has come into the world after Adam, every person that is born, we are born dead spiritually in sin. And each one of us, having to atone for that sin on our own and pay the penalty for it. What was that penalty? Death, right? So that's why Jesus came. Jesus came on our behalf 
to live the perfect life that we could never live, the sinless life, to die as a sacrifice on our behalf, so that in Him we can be born again into the new life in Christ. He accomplished this work on the cross. And John gives us his mini commentary in verse 33 to point this out. Jesus says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. And John tells us this he said, signifying by what death he would die. Jesus is headed to the cross not only for the glory of the Father but for judgment and also for salvation. And now as we move into verse 34, we see the people don't understand Jesus' purpose, right? Because they only have eyes for the physical. It says this, he said, signifying by what, by what death he would die, and the people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? And it gives me a chuckle because how many times has Jesus explained to them who the son of man is? And yet here they are asking this question again because their vision of the Messiah did not line up with the true vision of what, who the Messiah was in Jesus. And now as we look at this question, posed by the people, we see their misunderstanding of Jesus. It stems from their misunderstanding of Scripture. They only focused on the passages of the Old Testament that speak of the Messiah reigning forever. They missed the parts of Scripture that talk about the Messiah dying and the mention of his death. Now, I'm going to give you a little window into the Calvary Chapel movement. I'm not going to tell you that Calvary's perfect. It's not. There's no denomination that is. Because we live in a broken world. And so as, as the church, our duty is to do the best we can, living within the life that Christ has given us, and to betray him, portray him the best that we can to the world. Right? Well, Calvary Chapel... In its founding, Chuck Smith, his vision for it was to preach the word, word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And so that's what we do here. And with that vision, compared to a topical study, now, topical study does serve a purpose, and it can be wonderful to study topically. But to go through verse by verse is a big reason... Um, well, Calvary Chapel stands out in that effect because of their commitment to that teaching, because of their commitment to the Word. And as you go through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, you're bound to deal with the difficult subjects of the Bible, right? You can't skip over them. You can't go topically bit by bit by bit just looking at the sunny side of God's word or the the side of God's word that makes us feel good right there's some stuff in here that's challenging that's hard that's like whoa that actually happened wild stuff and Jesus I think in pointing out or in as we see the people's misunderstanding of what Jesus was saying it stems from kind of this place of they only ever heard the Old Testament teach topically. All of the teachers of the day were only focused on all of the good that the Messiah was going to bring, the glory, the exaltation, the kingdom. And they missed the part of, hey, Jesus, the Messiah is going to bring to himself the whole world, not just the Jewish nation. And he has to die for it. And Jesus doesn't, he doesn't get into a theological discussion with them or a theological argument. He simplifies it. We see where their misunderstanding comes from, but Jesus isn't going to say, hey, 
you know, looking back in Scripture, this is what it says. He has pointed that out, but Jesus is going to point out to them that, hey, I'm not here to argue theology with you. I'm here to point out that your time is now. Your chance with me is now. And so you need to be willing to come to me right now. And he points out the opportunity for salvation that is right in front of them. Jesus says, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. The light was shining. And they better take advantage of their opportunity to be saved. And John is going to finish verse 36 by putting a close to his record of Jesus' public ministry. It says, These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So after Jesus says this, he he goes away and the people are unable to find him. It doesn't sit, tell us this time that he went to Bethany or wherever. Um, but he goes away. And it was judgment on the nation that saw his miracles, heard his messages, and scrutinized his ministry, and yet refused to believe on him. Jesus has been wrestling with the Pharisees. We've seen it so much in the book of John. And he's given them, you know, so many opportunities to come and to discuss with him the greater things of God, right? He's been trying to get them to understand his purpose for being there. And, but there is a timeline. There is a timeline of the Father. And so his time spent with the Jewish nation, among the people, talking with the Pharisees is now up. And he's going to now invest his time into his private ministry within his private group of his disciples and his followers. He's going to invest in their faith. And for us, as the church, we are living in similar times, right? We're Jesus to the world around us. And his return is coming soon. And for us, that signals, that also signals judgment on the world. The Jewish people had their time with Jesus. Their judgment was now complete. Jesus is not going to be hanging out with them anymore. And we are the light shining, inviting people to come and to join in the family of God. Jesus, Jesus has placed his light within us to go and accomplish his work. So, let us shine brightly in order that we may bring people to Jesus. For there is a time coming when the opportunity to accept Jesus' offer of salvation will be gone. Just as Jesus told the Jews that their opportunity to spend time with him would soon be gone. And we see that fulfillment here in our lesson today. So, go out, be bold, and live within the life that is within you. Jesus' life. Let that light shine before men. I'm going to pray and then um, I'll dismiss you guys and you have a great Sunday. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity, the study of your word. And for the light that you've placed in us, Jesus, your, your light and salvation is within us. It's available to us. It's available to all. And so we pray that um, your church here would do a good work, would carry out your work that you've called us to, and that we can be a blessing to the world around us on your behalf. May God bless you and keep you. 
and make his face to shine upon you. May you lift up his countenance and his grace. And may you go forth in, in the same boldness that Jesus had. To go out in the boldness of him, to live this life for him as a living sacrifice that we can present that him, his life through us can present us to the Father as holy, acceptable, and pleasing to him. In Jesus' name, amen.